It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. You can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting. You can just email me directly at Opperman Investigations at gmail.com. Uh, go to Spreaker, Spreaker.com. There every Friday night to a live show. Um, uh, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's where we put up all the new live uh, podcast content. And if you go there and look up Captain Pink, Alan Graham, you'll find two previous interviews I've done with our guest today. He's the brother-in-law of Jim Morrison, um, has his own background uh, in intelligence work, and then he went to work for Larry Flint, Husser Publications, and knows all of those characters uh, around there. The Mitch Bell story. He knows um, uh, Bill Menser and uh, uh, Alex Marti, uh, Bill Ryder, and that whole crew. What a crew, man, that uh, Flint had around him. Uh, Mr. Uh, Alan Graham. By the way, you can find Alan Graham's books before we introduce Mr. Graham. At coronado dash Clarion, C L A R I O N dot com, front slash silo, S I L O. Uh, you can find his books, uh, which are called I Remember Jim Morrison 2, Before the Beatles Were Famous, and Poet Rain by Alan Graham. Mr. Graham, are you there? I am. Thank you, young man, for calling. No, thank you so much, man. I've really enjoyed our, our, our conversations on and off the air. Uh, you're very kind to me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for being um, uh, flexible with me today. I really appreciate that, well, too, as well. Let me give you a compliment back. I've been interviewing and talking to people for years, but I've never found anyone so succinct and prepared. Oh, thank you very much. Criti- critical for a good radio or good interview, per se. And yeah. you're, you somehow have a, a unique way of being able to succinctly place your questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, I really appreciate that, my friend. Thank you so much. Uh, why don't you remind the audience, so, wait, no, as I uh, described his book, you know, uh, Jim Morrison's brother-in-law and Larry Flint, but how would you describe yourself? Myriad. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Some dogs are barking and my, my god dogs are responding. That's fine. No one will Stop notice it. that. Stop that. Go ahead, young man. Yeah, you know, I, I would agree, you know, because uh, I was checking out your website today, the coronado-clarion.com uh, uh, website, and uh, you have all these different interests in art and poetry and uh, uh, music and entertainment, and all these different uh, uh, varied interests, like a renaissance man. I, I was really well, impressed with that. In, in intelligence, the truth is, what you appear to be and what you are mm. are completely and utterly different things. So, and always it is to best to be, you know, like, what should I say? Nebulous. Mm. Not certain of who you're talking to, but by the evidence that is issued in the conversation, you know then, without someone telling you, well, I'm this and that and I'm all of these. What your content is, what you give off, what you give out, to the interview is the truth. That's so true. And I find whenever I'm, I meet somebody new and they start telling me, well, this is the kind of person I am. Well, that's just the way I am. This is how, this, this is what I, whenever they say those things, my ears perk up because they say, uh. <laughs> yeah, that's, so uh, it's a standard, standard textbook answer, which means nothing at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you get involved with Larry Flint? Well, Directly, it was because my father-in-law, Admiral Morrison, had put the kibosh on a very big project. It was going to be the biggest project ever because it had the goods in the story. It was a true life and times of Jim Morrison. It was a little bit of a boost, and that was my life because whatever project I was on, I always had an alter ego or I had... Someone who I not as much answered to, but coordinated with. And if it was big, it was this person. If it was medium, it was that person. But it was always some outside agency, or say agency, outside entity that was involved. Because the truth is this: there is no great fortune or great, no rock star in making up in you know in the billions or millions. 
that isn't managed one way or the other. Other people have interests in, you think it's just the rock star and his manager and his lawyers. They are punk compared to the big picture. Because a record company or any major management company has has interests that have got to be protected above and beyond the stupid mistakes that the rock star makes or his manager makes or his amateur management company makes. They're just they're just on low on the totem pole because the truth is finance rules. Rules. So if you have a record company and a management company and a whole bunch of other people who have interest, they come first. Be damned the law, be damned the legal system, be damned the wills and the and the um, you know, like the the when you Everything is secondary to whoever is managing the money. And, and like sometimes have, these, probi- the artists are worth probi- more, more, more. The artists are sometimes worth more dead than alive. Ultimately, all of them. Hmm. If you look at if you look at the twenty seven fell alone, or you look at all of the people who have passed, they were they were solid gold. I mean, the ones who were solid gold. Well, way beyond the street level, way beyond the, yeah, for example, a probate court has all this power. Not so. Mm. Not so. The probate court is as corrupt as any other. I mean, it looks legal, but there's always someone behind the scenes saying to the probate judge or mm. to the top executive, this is the way it goes. For example, let's take Pamela Curzon. She was three years in probate. Along the way, she was in deep debt, way beyond anyone could ever believe, because she was managed. She was a junkie, and she was, let's say, kept a junkie. There was no such thing as rehab, but there were many, many, many IOUs she was she lived lavishly like most people are struggling waiting lavishly by a heroin bill alone she had all kind of peccadilloes all kind of little lust and secret things that she all were kept buried but all were recorded and at the end there was always listen to this word a reckoning a reckoning mean in mathematical terms on one side of the ledger were debentures and debentures and IOUs and on and on. On the other side was how much is it going to cost to settle all of this? Mm. You understand? Yeah. So she was deeply in debt, and by the time she died, like I'll give you one example. A mere million dollars back then in the 80s would have been, uh, well, three and a half, four times as much, right? So you borrowed a million then, you were borrowing four in today's world. So I bought a lot, but the truth is this. There were many, many markers on that woman, and she was, before the probate was ended, everyone was in place. And I'll give you one example. The hoodlums, the Adler brothers, who owned the Roxy Rock and Roll Club, just came over to the accountant, his name is Bob Green. I believe he's still alive. Just came over to him one day and said, uh, you'll lend us $1 million to remodel the Roxy, and that will be the end of our contract with you. He just did what they said. It wasn't until 1983 that I discovered that it was not only him, but several others who looted the estate while the doors were still alive, while it was in probate, while Jim Morrison's parents were waiting, while everyone was waiting, oblivious to the fact that she had gone into debt. It was kept private, but it was not kept secret from the cabal. I call them the cabal. They own everything. They are beyond bankers. They are beyond lawyers. They are beyond DAs and judges. And There is no reckoning like the cabal. When they come... They come for cash, A, because they know where it is, and B, they know what you borrowed. 
let me ask you this, because off the air, you, you, was, you, mentioned, you mentioned Courtney Love, the, the wife of Kurt Cobain. Um, I said the same story. The same, right. And I, I became close friends with her father, Hank Harrison. Yeah. I'd be shocked if you didn't run across him in your travels, you know, because he was around the Beatles, too, and, uh, um, and uh, especially the Grateful Dead. Um, and, and one of the things he told me was that um, he found out that at MTV, at these MTV parties, uh, they at the end of the night, they would do these occult rituals, like almost yes. satanic rituals. Uh, there seems to be a lot of that influence uh, over the music industry. Now, is that who you're talking about, who this cabal is? When, when, when I say cabal, I mean all of that is encapsulated because the truth is this. Most of it was mind control, hmm. ultimately for financial gain. But mostly these people were children, the rock stars were oh, wallflowers. The managers were oblivious to the real world, only their own egos. And they were pumped and primped and pimped. And every single one of them belonged to, or maybe unknowingly, belonged to the secret cult of the Illuminati. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. That's, that's Illuminati comes in many forms. In the end, it is it's called Illuminati, people of the light on the surface. It is PR wing. But this is who controls all the finances of the world. The world. We went down this road because I asked you how you got hooked up with Larry Flint. And you said your father-in-law put the kibosh on a deal and, and something happened, and then we went off into this other tangent here. But how, how did you get hooked up with Larry Flint? Well, as I said, my father-in-law stopped. Uh, he, he doesn't have the right, so don't finance him. And he went around and blackballed me with every single movie company, Alan Ladd Productions, Warner Brothers, every one of them who had interest in what I was doing. I had my father-in-law's tacit approval. He gave me his blessing and said, go ahead, son, on tape. When, the, when all of the people heard his voice and me talking about it, that was top launch for me. I was just about to take my pick, and I heard a rumor. My wife called me one morning and said, someone just called me, a lawyer, said that, that you've been, we've been blackballed. And I said, are you kidding me? We called her father on. She said, Dad, we just heard that you blackballed us after, um, oh, yeah, it was him, by the way, they said. He said, that's not true, honey. Don't believe your Hollywoods are just a bunch of lies. So we went on. Next thing I know is a lawyer came in physical form, a well-known name, said, Alan, if you go ahead, every single thing you do will be, let's say, blown up. She called her father-in-law the next morning and said, Dad, did you or didn't you? He said, what are you talking about, honey? She said, we know from, and gave the name of the lawyer. And he said, well, you know, honey, I must admit, I, I, I was trying to protect Alan, and I was trying to protect you. And I said, why didn't you tell us? He said, you'd have found out in the end, just like that. So I said, okay, what shall I say? Double down livid and angry called him up and said there's nothing you can do now you cannot call this back this is like asking Luca Brasi to back off he said son I know you're determined but I'm afraid it's the bigger picture is this I said no it isn't I went double down triple down I went out and got the worst financing I could find one of them was Larry Flint but I didn't get him he called me. I had a, a full-page ad in the L.A. Times. No, I'm sorry. A big ad in the L.A. Times saying, looking for co-producer to the Jim Morrison movie. Not one call from one studio, but a lot of calls from, oh, my God. People you wouldn't want to even mention. I picked Larry Flint because at the time he called, I was in the hospital doing stuff in kidney stones. I was on Demerol. And he called me and said, oh, this is the way it really went down, to be quite honest with you. I woke up 
one morning, my wife was sitting by the side of my bed, and I said, oh, my God, I just had this incredible dream. Larry Flint called me from his mansion, and he wanted me to come in. He was interested in financing. And she went, oh, oh what are you laughing at? She said he called in real life. Huh. So that was one of the many prophetic dreams I've had throughout my life. The next morning, it was verified. He said he called, his voice sounded just I told him what he sounded like. Yeah, that was him. So I pre dreamed. Well, called him up right from my bed and said, uh, Al Graham, he said, I don't know what I'm going to my mansion. And when I come into my office, I chose him. The office, because it was more, they would be able to find my body, maybe not at the mansion. Okay, because I knew of his reputation. Yeah. Uh, so I got out of the hospital early, still bleeding from the kidney stones, so anxious to put this deal together. When I got there, I read the room immediately. I saw all the sycophants, I saw all the people peeking in behind his back, I saw all the all the wannabes and all of the hitmen and all of the bodyguards glaring at me as I went in. I came out of the room in three hours with not only a check, a pink check for $10,000 seed money, which would have been, you know, $200,000 back then. Got the money, got a contract, make a movie. Alan Graham and Larry Flint and Morrison would agree to make a movie. I got my percentage, and I got my upfront money. I was financed. That's when all hell broke loose. I go home with the money. I begin to write a script. Only this is the way it went. He had a dictaphone machine. He wanted me to call in in the middle of the night after all was done and record this, the, the, the dictaphone machine would automatically engage and I would tell him my story. The next morning when I went in to see him for weeks on end, his secretary would have had a beautiful transcript perfectly laid out. He would have read it and understood it and asked me more details to fill it in. It was going like gangbusters. Everything was great. And then knock, knock, knock. On the door came the feds. They were, they were there to demand that he give up all of his information on the Vicky Morgan sex tapes, the Alfred Broomingdale case, the Roy Raiden murder case with Mensa and all those people. And he said, at the time, by the way, we didn't know about the Mensa case, but they knew Mensa was working for Flint. When I came out of that room, I had full power of attorney. He acquiesced to every single detail that I proposed, knocking out his sister and her cabal, his brother and his cabal, Bill Ryder, the, and that would include Bill Mincer, their cabal, and several other people like the people who had invested or were stockholders, not stockholders, they were distributors and they had a, a very important first position interest in getting their money every month for the distribution fees. He charged them through the nose, but they got huge amounts of money every month. All of this is now interrupted in the hands of yours truly. I said to Bill Ryder, you have 11 ghost security guards that are no longer on the payroll. He was getting half. He was giving them a half. They weren't ghosts at all. They were just double-paid security guard. He had a vast income coming from there. I stopped it. Same with Althea Flint, the same with every one of them who had an, any kind of contract with Flint. He was so far gone on heroin, he was managed. So everyone knew that he was a cash cow, except until I came. This is when my life became not worth a plug nickel, but because I have my own backup, I was... Not that they didn't try, believe me, but I was, I survived. But then, then what was your, what was your backup? MI6, uh, what was your backup? 
if I had to tell you, I'd have to kill all of us. Okay, well, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty miserable these days. Put <laughs> me out of my misery. <laughs> all right, what's your address? <laughs> okay, you don't know yet? Okay, let me ask a quick question then. How does a naval admiral have this kind of uh, juice in Hollywood to put the kibosh and put a black ball on you? Well, this is where Hollywood ends and the world begins. They cannot move a muscle without every single right, every single I and T dotted and crossed. Otherwise, they'd be in a lawsuit. So they must have the power, and that is this time, the Admiral was the father of the rock star. Mm. And he held all of it. Okay. But he was also, he was also managed... Where does Flint fit into this uh, uh, cabal, Illuminati? Where is, is he an outsider? How does he fit into all that? Completely oblivious to it. Yeah. Knowing to- totally on heroin for, you know, three or four years by now. Imagined one morning I got a call. It's Alan, 5 a.m. I want a layer jet. I want it ready to go in one hour. I want you to come down pick us up at that mansion, go to Van Nuys Airport, and then fly to Russia. First, it would be the most northern place we could get, which would be Alaska. Yeah. Flew to Fairbanks, Alaska. Along the way, picked up all kind of misfits, 12 on the plane. We landed the first in Oregon. Got a letter directly from the American attache in New in, uh Moscow said, Mr. Graham, take your lunatic cabal and return home now. And we did not. We went further until we got a physical call. Nastiest looking bastards you've ever met. Scruffy too. Not looking like official. Nasty, but with credential. And I don't mean physical credential. With facial credential mm. and weapon credential and the truth in your eyes if ever you saw one it was so nasty they had no emotion junkyard dogs they would have thrown a small package up into the landing gear and <laughs> over the yeah. you get it? Yeah, I get it yeah they would have had some over the, flight troubles there. over the <laughs> flight, over flight the ocean, delays <laughs> over the ocean we would have yeah. been Chaff. Blown into a billion pieces. I've seen this before. I've been there on several occasions when it's happened, small planes, and it's as untraceable, untraceable as anything you've ever seen. So, okay, so in, in order to stand up to. Um, it's my understanding Bill Ryder was CIA, but, but you say no. Not so. Uh, and, and guys like uh, uh, Menser, he was no slouch, right? One of his. Really? What, what do you know of the, uh, about the story about Bill Mentzer and Carol King's ex-husband? <laughs> Everything that came out of Mentzer's mouth was either fantasy or wannabe. <laughs> Everything. Not the Every single thing. Not the Raiden murder. No, I'm talking about his, his machinations. Okay. For example... Connected? Not so. Never. He was a Vietnam private with a pension for killing because he was a psychopath. He had no emotions whatsoever. When you looked at him, his eyes would constantly twitch, blink. He had some kind of traumatized um, skull. That's all I can say. And And the rest of it was people say, well... He was in Vietnam. He is a big hit man. He was known to be a nasty little man. And they just assumed. I think everybody who had an imagination or a fantasy or a conspiracy theory, he fit the profile. Yeah. He had his he had his own little James Bond car and he was the first one I ever saw with a very cool uh radio in his car. He looked apart. But but he was doing security at, at these uh, big rock stars and celebrities and stuff like that, right? He was picked up only 
by Bill Ryder because they knew each other in Vietnam. Okay. Period. And a bunch of others that we knew. They were all Vietnam psychopaths. Gotcha. And because they could kill and would kill and did kill without feeling. Well, what about the, the allegations he was involved in the Arliss Perry murder up in Stanford? That is true. Oh, really? Yes. Well, but but that story is that it, it was on behalf of, of the cult, the, the Process Church cult. It was on behalf of the money. Okay. So what? What? Do you, and, and and in that theory, that allegation that he killed um, Arliss Perry. He was described as someone in those circles that was being described as Charles Manson too, the second Charles Manson. Have you ever heard that? Yes. Okay. So so then was he traveling in those circles or not? Let me tell you this. Look back through your 60s history. Okay. You will find gurus who have never been found. Um, many wannabes, but dangerous enough to, it, to threaten the interests of bigger people, and they were offed. Right. They were dime a dozen back then. There's half a dozen you'll never know that never showed up because they, they were halfway amateurs. They disappeared. They had no real relatives. They were all either orphans or misfits in society. Never even worried about, never even checked on. But they did come awfully close and mostly unknowingly to the to the two they flew too close to the sun hmm. that was a long pause by me why or by you, you? <laughs> why did you pause so long well I'm just thinking here I was going to ask it well, to move on to the next question then uh, you want to tell us uh, who Mitch Warbell was and, and what were the circumstances around his uh, uh, the threat to his life and ultimately the end of his life he was the most valuable asset I ever had in my life hmm. he, he ran a uh, a mercenary school in Georgia, show you how to chop down a man from 50 feet away in an instant with an Uzi. Carried two on either side, half crippled little fucker, man. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, you'd seen action in Afghanistan and everywhere else. In ahead of any invasion with his little team, big team. He had a little edge over everyone else. And he, in the end, after, just before he died, he gave me a souvenir. And it said, General Mitch Rebell, CIA file room. And I often wondered how he could get all the information I needed, but he could go to the, to the CIA file room without question, without security, just walk right in and open anybody's anybody's file including the president's yeah. and that's the truth all the dirt that ever was was held in the grubby little hands of Mitch Waddell and I often used him to get information I would never have been able to get and when he died I lost my most valuable assets Why did uh, Flint want him dead? It was not Flint. Oh. Flint used him like he called whores, I'm sorry. Yeah. Prostitu All lawyers are prostitutes. And he didn't pay him if he could not. If he could. And anyone he hired to do something for him, like Mitch Bell. Mitch Bell was capable of calling it all in. The cavalry. Mm. I mean, all of it. And he gave me that access. So Flint was after something from, from, uh, from Mitch. And that was eventually there would be an all-out 
elimination of a lot of people. <laughs> That's right. He was going to take out uh, Hugh Hefner, uh, Al Goldstein, all, all the competitors, all the all the the, the, uh, the five families how of about, the pornographic about, magazines. How about Frank Sinatra? Right, how about the mayor of New York? You know what? There's not one thing funny about that song. Okay. I don't know why you're laughing. Well, <laughs> it, it was blood curdling. If you stood in my shoes, you you were often going, "Oh dear God, oh dear God, I've seen some things, but this is it." And it would have happened, mm -hmm. except for Alan Graham. I had the keys to the kingdom. I had the checkbook. I had the chief financial officer, Paul Miseradino, under my thumb. One evening, we were sitting in a mansion, and Flint said to me, "Alan, this was my campaign speech." 31 pages long. I want a copy of it in Telegram, not message, Telegram, real Telegram, on the desk of every congressman tomorrow morning or Sunday night. I called up Western Useless. How much is it going to cost? I had two prices, one for the message, which would have been about $58,000. Everyone to get a Gail Graham. He said, no, I want a full telegram. It was $280,000. Mm. I called up Mr. Dino in the middle of the dinner. I said, I want a check for $280,000 made out to Western Useless. There'll be a courier here in one hour. Have it ready. It was in my hand in 45 minutes. Western Useless came. It was in their hands. But, and that's the way it went. Uh, but I'm more curious about the check that was made out for the assassination of Mitch Warbell. Uh, who was that check made out to? I don't know where you got the assassination check for Mitch Warbell. That would have only come across my desk. No, it's in the FBI, uh, the, in those FBI documents. And, and, it, and it, it, came, was, it came out in some civil litigation, too, with Bill Ryder. Is it, was it ever shown? Yeah, I, I think I think I'm, I'll have to go back and look and get back no, to you. No, no. Okay, but no, then what no, happened? No. They want uh, Flint wanted to kill Warbell. What happened then? Why didn't they go through it? What happened? Flint Flint did not want to kill Warbell. I don't know where this comes from. No matter what they say in any trial, remember, words are words, actions are actions. Mitch Warbell was a great asset. Why would he want him killed? I don't remember why. I don't. I'll have to get well, back to you on that. But. Well, then get me some empirical information that says you saw a check. Yeah. And Larry Flint was, and it came from Larry Flint. First of all, there would never have been a check. It would have been the cash that I held. Okay. Then how did Mitch Warbell die? He, he was ill, alcoholic. Anyway, <clears throat> he came one day to the courthouse. The police arrested him on a tip that he had a dagger in the handle of his walking stick. Mm. By God, he did. He did. It was a seven-inch dagger, at least a little piece of machinery. They twisted the top, just like they were told, and he went to jail. Then we got him out of jail. He fell ill, allegedly. He was just... Broken down, without alcohol for two days, in a terrible mess, he was placed in UCLA Emergency Ward. He and his wife sat there for days, not hearing from anybody, because there was a, you know, a silence upon him. There should be no words to be spoken. He called Bill Ryder, and I think Alex Marty went with him, or some other guy. Mm. When they got to the hospital, he was met by the wife who freaked out when she saw Bill Ryder. She said, you're the one who's coming to kill him, aren't you? He said, no, I, he called me. And she said, no, he didn't. She wouldn't let him see him. At the same time she was talking to him, something was put in his tray by somebody else. He died within the hour. Wait, and one more time, who were the people in the room at the time? Say that again. One more time. Who were the people in the room with him at the time when something was put in his tray? Myself only. Only yourself. Well, myself and another operative. 
Okay, and you didn't notice anybody putting anything in this tray? What's your next question? <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. I, I was because I, I, as I was talking, I'm scrolling through this FBI document. It's like 300 pages long. I wanted to find that check. <laughs> I can't get back to you on that. Um, so you'll that, never find you'll never find an LFP check for a hit on any single human. I'm the one who dispensed uh, 20 million dollars in cash. Two and a half when I flew into Springfield in cash for a specific disposal. Cash. No thing, nothing like, lots of like, oh, Western Union checks, mm. 10,000 a year, five, but no such thing as like, there's a contract from Lifeline to kill Mitch Bell, sign like, what bullshit. Okay, wait. No, but the thing is, okay, this thing is 300 pages long. Have you ever looked through this document up? It's an FBI, FBI. Yes. You've looked through it? Okay. I, I trust that as much as I trust uh, last uh, month um, Hustler magazine. No, no. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, let's see. I asked off the Ted Gunderson. If you remember Ted Gunderson, the former FBI agent uh, in charge of yeah. L.A., uh, that I, I got in word that he was working for Flint, too. Do you have any knowledge of that? Ted Gunderson, Jerry West. The FBI agent in charge of the John DeLorean case, and a whole bunch of others who were double agents. Mm. Do you have any information that Ted Gunnison was still working for the FBI right before his death? No. Okay. But you're never out. Yeah. That's a fact. Yeah. I, I heard he actually had an office. He, was still, he still had an office at the uh, FBI. No, LA. no. That, that would have... That would have been blatantly amateur. Well, I got to tell you though, I, I was I, I, I talked to somebody who was there, you know, and it, it's and, and, and I can't I don't know what to say. I got a, I got a witness. Uh, that's all I can say. No, 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 you don't. You have someone who said that. Hmm. No way, no way would the FBI leave a trail like a rope dangling like that. No way. Gotcha. For any, anybody to know. What can you tell us about the story of Irv Rubin? Irv uh, Rubin was very useful to me. He and his radical. I mean, those were the guys who bombed Alex O'Day's house. Mm. Alex O'Day was a Palestinian activist journalist. And they put a package in his house and all kind of like Palestinian logo and whatever all over it. Alex O'Day was so excited he jumped down, he opened it up and it blew his head through the ceiling of his kitchen. No matter what they tell you about his front door, he was sitting at his table opening that box. That was Irv Rubin. That was well, Irv Rubin went down for precisely the same operation with another uh, one of his enemies he was snitched off before it happened this time, but he was behind many, many, many bombings or burnings or exposing of Nazis. That was his real job. Yeah. His big connection was Mayor Kahana of the Kak Party in Israel. Also, a connection of mine. He would often come to New York and give speeches about getting rid of all the Palestinians, and he was loathed. And one day, a black man, a hit man, nothing more, was just blew him out of his lectern when he was giving a speech in L.A. just walked out, blew him, killed him. So that was where Irv Rubin's knowledge of everything came from. Uh, Mark Hanna had a very good network from old Haganah, the whole Israeli... Uh, you know, what shall I say? Knockoff squad. The Nakam Begum was one of them, mm. the beginner. And so they had all the information all over the world of every Nazi, every current thing. They were constantly, they never gave up. They, there were no statutes of limitations. There were no markers of Queensberry rules when it came to statute of limitations or you couldn't get them anymore. They found them and they killed them. And, and who was Nick? 
Agreed. Yeah, you mentioned when you were talking about the, the Irv Rubin uh, dropping off that bomb, you, you mentioned the name Nick. No, I said Alex O'Gay. Okay. Okay, I thought I heard you say Nick. Um, Irv Rubin. Okay, now, now, now what about uh, what do you know about then uh, Jewish Defense League, uh, Meyer Kahana, uh, and their connections to Mossad? Absolutely all strings, all connections of any intelligence, any Nazi hunting, Simon Wiesenthal's, um after he died, all of that information is in one single file. It's in the CIA room. Hmm. They're all connected, no matter how much they don't appear to be. This is the great stealth of it. What appears to be this could not be. Maybe. Or is it? And this is the magic of stealth. So, Irv Rubin, I employed him because my life was under constant threat. Every time I'd arrive at the airport, Rubin would be there with his people with automatic weapons to take me to where I wanted to go. Plus, I had a street gang, Mexican, well, I would, back then we were called La M. Right, La M. Yeah. And then I had a division of American Indians with their own little group. Apaches, actually. Lethal. And several backup groups that worked directly for me, sometimes for cash, sometimes out of nothing but pure love. Because my main bodyguard was also Ann Morrison's bodyguard. We did the rock opera. That's when um, we the Indians came because they loved Jim Morrison. They're all into his whole Indian persona, mm. and they just immediately attached onto the rock opera. All my people around me were and walked across every room to every toilet to every car. Hand walked by these powerful, I mean, powerfully spiritual, dedicated. Apache Indians. The most loyal people I ever met in my life, and that's the truth. Let me ask you this. When I was looking at your website, you, you have a, an article there about the, the, the abduction of Jimi Hendrix, and he didn't know he had been abducted? Yeah, dumb as a brick. <laughs> well, what, can you tell us what happened there? He did, well, he was saying, I want to kill this guy. I want to kill that guy. Everyone, he, they would, couldn't shut him up. His own people couldn't shut him up. So some people came, and he was partying with them. <laughs> he thought he was hostage for four or five days, I think. So someone in the end got to his money and said, if he's going to hit anybody, it won't be with our money. So... He, could, he came back unknowing that he was gone, even, because he was so far off on heroin. And when he tried that again, he, by the way, he mostly forgotten it. It was just because some guy slighted him. And that's all it was. But he, he became more dangerous than anyone because he would have done it. That's how junked out he was. When I say people are managed, they're managed by somebody so much bigger than you can imagine. Everything is connected. Hmm. There's nothing that is not connected when it comes to big finances. There may be individual ones that escape it, but in the end, uh, let's, I'm going to give you an example. The statesman. That's what I always called him, or them, because there were many different ones. But the statesman would come in. Now, let me give you an example of the best statesman I ever heard of. Vito Corleone. Mm. And he was based on a real fellow, which you, and we shall be nameless. But this guy, if you'll ever notice in the movie, he was, he was the guy who could work with the most mortal enemies of each other and make a deal between them, and they would agree to it because it was statesmanship. The big picture of a man who can work across all lines, banking, religious, spiritual, criminal, any way at all, this guy could get in and make the deal. So when you saw 
the godfather bring his son back from Sicily, freed of all those charges, it was because he could make a deal. And that meant with the cops, who you do not make a deal with when it comes to killing a cop. You cannot make a deal. However, you've got some other family member who comes forward and admits to it. And it's accepted, even though they know it's not true. Mm. Uh, see what I mean? Yes. That's how a statesman works. Yeah, I, I've seen that myself in organized crime cases where someone will confess and take the fall uh, and they had nothing well, to that, do with that, it. That's just, that's just part of it. Yeah. The big picture The big picture is once again, whose finances, whose finances are at interest or threatened or could be enhanced or depleted because of this. It's always, always about the money. Remember this famous quote from a very famous French philosopher, I think it was, I'm not sure, I believe it was Descartes, said, behind every great fortune is a great crime. Mm. Which means no one got their money honestly. Someone was offed. I covered it up, of course, but behind every fortune there is a crime. Real quick, because we are running out of time. Uh, what was Flint's problem with uh, uh, Frank Sinatra? Not one single thing. Huh. He just randomly, willy-nilly picked somebody he didn't like. At that time, Frank Sinatra was gone. He did a complete U-turn with his politics because of Kennedy. He was now a full-on Republican. Mm -hmm. All the mob were his friends before, but when they kicked him out, the mob didn't uh, didn't kick him out. But when Kennedy's brother and the CIA and all the other people said, "If you keep hanging around with the mob, we're done." Sinatra went to every rally for the unions. In fact, it was the union boss, not the not the Godfather, who went and said, "It's going to be your brains." or your signature on that contract. It was a simple union man who went to Dorsey and said, listen, I understand you got my boy in a contract. He said, yeah, I do. I'm going to keep it. He's a cash cow. And he said, do you like playing in all these big hotels in New York City where you're making a lot of money? He said, I sure do. And he said, well, you won't be anymore. Frankie goes. And that night, his contract was lifted. Not like you see in the movies. That's what happened. Well, let's see. We only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, what would you like to leave us with? Are you telling me that we've gone an hour? Almost? We've gone 51 minutes, so we got like another three minutes yeah. left. I'm, te I'm telling you, dude, I could talk to you forever. I could sit and talk to you for, uh, for two hours. No, it's one, once again, it's down to you for asking such important questions, but asking them the right way. Otherwise, I'd have been talking to an amateur, and I mostly do. That's the truth. I have to explain every little detail. You've got some background in intelligence or, you know, um, you're a private eye, so you know a little more. You're above the, you're above the grade, son. So here's my last thing to you. I'm 80, hmm. and I'm still fully active. In fact, so busy right now, that now that I've been sick for a few days, my work is piling up, but it's also so well managed that it's a pleasure now to do it. And I have many cases, just because of my reputation, people call and say, can you make a call? Yes, I can. And I do. Yep. And a lot of it, believe it or not, a lot of it I give to charity. Whatever I get. I give to charity. I have an orphanage in Pakistan where I'm taking out 500 children one at a time from a brick factory where they've been sold into slavery mm. by their parents because they're so broke. I have an orphanage called Rosewater Orphanage, a Bible college, and a school. And I feed the poor every Sunday. You can look at my website and see it, Rosewater Orphanage. And if anybody wants to donate something to a good cause, they should take a look at, you take a little child, eight years old with a lump on his head from a hammer, and some rich, awful person 
who employed him to clean their toilets didn't do it quick enough, and just give him a little bop on the head. Mm. That's the abuse level in Pakistan. I'm over there with a Christian church right in the middle of a bunch of Muslims, and we survive. It really is uh, incredible what goes on around the world with, with human trafficking and and. and uh, you wouldn't. Oh God! You wouldn't. It would kill you if you lay in your bed and saw slave about. labor. It breaks. It breaks my heart. Yeah. We've been talking to Alan Graham, also known as Captain Pink. Uh, brother-in-law of Jim Morrison, uh, and yeah. notorious career with uh, Larry Flint. Uh, you can check out his website. I really recommend you check it out and go here. It's coronado-clarion.com, front slash silo. And there's a ton of stuff on here. Very interesting life of Alan Graham here. Many varied interests. He's got this uh, Jim Morrison Museum you can check out coming up in uh, Cancun, Mexico. That's coming up. And a speakeasy-type uh, tour. You could find them uh, uh Underground, the last whiskey bar, and get a hold of them at the lizard live at yahoo.com. I want to do something unusual now. Shoot. I want to, I want to give a phone number, a hotline, 619-415-2967. That's my main number, but it, uh, I have it linked to many, many other uh, places, so... If you call in, someone calls in and says, I need help or I'm going to donate to your ministry or I have a case you're interested in, call that number 24-7. If it's not me, it's somebody will answer and you will get an immediate response. Don't call me with anything awful or disgusting. I will not do it. Just cause I'm your man. Yeah, but be respectful too, and I, I recommend you send a text first. So six one nine four one five two nine six seven. Uh, be, yeah. be polite to my friend Graham here. If I find there's a problem now, you're going to hear from me. Alan Graham, Captain Pink, uh, once again here. Um, uh, uh, Coronado dash Clarion dot com for such silo, and be respectful of Mr. Graham. If I find out otherwise, well, my audience giving this guy a problem. Uh, <laughs> there's gonna, thank you, son. Thank you. Son. There's going to be trouble. Now listen. Yes. You and I have just begun a relationship. I've got many more things to tell you off the record if you want. I agree. But worth two or three books. I agree. Hey, one more time, two of those books we're talking about here is called um, uh, I Remember Jim Morrison 2, T-O-O, and Before the Beatles Were Famous, and once again, Poet Rain by Alan Graham. Alan Graham, thank you so much. Uh, I'll be in touch. Thanks, son. Goodbye. Good night, sir. Goodbye.